I'm reminded of what uh, the Apostle Paul wrote in the end of the book of Romans, as he neared the last book, or the last chapter in that book. Chapter 16, Paul began um, talking about the old King James salute, sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so, and, -so, and and I, I feel a little bit like that tonight uh, because there are so many in our assembly tonight that have had such an impact on my life. And uh, I am so appreciative of them. And I would be uh, remiss if I didn't at least mention a couple of them. So please bear with me and then we'll get to the lesson. Uh, in the back, uh, near the back on this side is Louise Bish. And Louise has been such a faithful Christian all the years of my life. I can remember they used to sit right in front of us uh, at Somerville. And... Uh, Louise was my Bible class teacher, and uh, she was actually my second Bible class teacher, from what I understand, because uh, up here on the right was Emily, and Emily always took the, uh, at that time, took the what they called the cradle roll or the, the little munchkins, and so Emily took us first, and Emily was a great encouragement. Her family has been such a help. David and I and Ryan uh, and Mike and Isaiah, we all grew up together, and we're all friends, and uh, just had a great time together, and there's a lot of memories that come to mind when I see these folks, but uh, really, to be perfectly honest with you, it's because of these ladies, and, and men as well, that I'm a Christian today. Um, of course, I told you last uh, night about uh, Mike's grandparents who led my parents to Christ, and um, I would not be in the church today. You see, how do you know that? Because I know myself, and I know the struggles that I have even as a Christian, and I'm afraid that I might be down a really, really different path had it not been for someone sharing the gospel with my parents, and of course my parents taking me to where the gospel could be shared and growing up in a Christian home. And so it's great, just a great joy to be back uh, in this area. It's a great joy to see those we love. It's a great joy to have several gospel preachers with us. I know of at least two, uh, Brother Joe Kiefer that I got to meet just a few moments ago, and Brother Randall Matheny. I believe that's the two we have. Do we have any other gospel preachers uh, that are in the assembly? I hate to, to do that and then miss somebody, but I know of those two for sure. And, uh, of course, Mike, and uh, we're just thankful for them and the work they do. And uh, just remember this, you'll never, ever overpay a good gospel preacher. You'll never overappreciate a good gospel preacher. Gospel preachers are a unique breed. It takes a special person to preach the gospel and to uh, go through the things that a person goes through as a gospel preacher and his family. Of course, my wife and children are with me tonight. But I always say they are the real troopers in all this. You know, the preacher often gets lauded. Oh, it's a great sermon preacher. And, and I'll tell you what, it's the, it's the Amandas and, uh, and, and the wives of our group, and uh, certainly my wife, that really stand behind good men and, and really give us the encouragement. And so uh, I'm appreciative of all of those folks. Of course, I'm appreciative of my family. Uh, my parents are here. My one heathen sister is here. <laughs> she, uh, she was always trouble growing up, gave me a lot of grief. And my other sister is not here, but she's trouble too. So fortunately, mom and dad stopped when they got to me, the third perfect child. And so we're here this morning. But, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about humility tonight, okay? <laughs> we actually are going to talk a little bit about humility. You know I say all that in jest for a little bit of fun. When you leave this life, you are going to be remembered for something. There's no question about it. You will be remembered for something. Think about the people that you know. When you think of some person's name, you remember them for something, don't you? I mean, you can't help but remember them. Let's, let's just have a little bit of an illustration on that. When I say Richard Nixon, what's the one thing you remember Mr. Nixon for? Watergate. Yeah, Watergate. It's, a, it's that scandal. I mean, it doesn't matter what he did before or what he did after. We're going to remember that scandal, aren't we? That's what we're going to remember about Mr. Nixon. If I think about Abraham Lincoln, what do you think about when you think about Abraham Lincoln? Maybe a couple things. Absolutely, yeah. I think about the Emancipation Proclamation. And uh, I think about uh, the fact that he was brave in doing that. Of course, I think about his presidency as the 16th president of the United States. What a, what a great man. What a... Uh, what a great man, the Gettysburg Address. You might think of the Gettysburg Address when you think of Abraham Lincoln. So no matter what you are or who you are, you will be remembered for something when this life is over. Joe, in the Bible, what do you think of? Patience. Absolutely. Uh, James, the book of James calls Job the man of patience. And he certainly was when we read the book that bears his name. There are men and women throughout the Bible that you think of, and when you think of that name, you associate something with them, either good or bad. And such is the case of our study tonight.
tonight, when I think about the one that is before us tonight, a lady by the name of Mary really is where our study is going to center around tonight. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to John chapter 12. Uh, for those who are visiting with us, we've been studying in the Gospel of John. And our goal is to really see Jesus' reaction to people and how he dealt with people so that we might know him better. That's our goal. We don't want to just go over the Bible narrative, although that's very valuable and we know that they're true. We want to see Jesus in that light so we not are just acquainted with him, but we really, really know him. Mary is one in John chapter 12 who is one of those memorials. In fact, Matthew, uh, this account that Matthew records in Matthew 26 and verse 13, he said, wherever this gospel shall be preached in a whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done for a memorial of her. So anytime the gospel is preached, Matthew records Jesus as saying, you know what? They're going to be talking about Mary uh, anointing my feet in particular. They're going to talk about that. That's going to be a center of conversation. And when you think about this Mary, you almost have to go to the time that is before us in John chapter 12. It's just sort of one of those memorials that are set up and, and that come before us. Tonight I want to get to know Jesus through this incident. And in order to do so, we're going to look at John chapter 12, and really in verse 1 beginning, we're going to set the context. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go down and note uh, several things throughout this chapter. And, and some people have commented on the sermons and very positively, and I appreciate that so very much. Um, the type of preaching I'm doing is known as expository preaching. And I really am a firm believer in it. In fact, uh, in the last several years, it's primarily what I do because I really believe the Word of God needs fed. Now, that's not saying that topical sermons don't feed you. Sometimes you have to preach a topical sermon. Uh, for example, if you're going to preach on baptism or the cross, there may not be one particular passage you can go to. But I found in my personal study and in my life, I get much more from studying paragraphs and books of the Bible. It feeds my soul and it teaches me more about the one whom I want to be like, and that is Jesus the Christ. In John chapter 12 and verse 1, we see Jesus getting ready to go to Bethany. However, prior to his trip to Bethany, he has a plot against him. There is a plot given against him. In fact, back in John chapter 11, verse 53, and remember, the chapter divisions were put there by men. The words of God, the word of God is inspired, but the chapter references are not. And so chapter 11 and chapter 12, there may not be any division. This is one of those bad divisions in a way, because John chapter 11 and verse 53 continues the plot into John chapter 12. John 11 and verse 53, then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. So Jesus has now a plot against him. You'll remember on the heels of this plot, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead and his good friend from Bethany. He had raised him from the dead. And remember that caused controversy with the unbelieving, un, uh, ungodly Jews of his day. Remember so much so that they wanted to kill Lazarus, or at least hide him and put him away. Why? Because they said if people see him, they'll know he was dead four days and they'll follow Jesus. They said they weren't honest with the evidence for certain. They put this plot to, to follow after Jesus. And so John chapter 11 in verse 54, Jesus, the Bible said, walked no more openly among the Jews. And no doubt went to spend some time with those who he was closest to. He's going through a, rare, a very emotional time right now. You know, sometimes we, over, uh, we overread that. We read over it and we, we sort of forget that our Lord was 100% deity. We believe that. John chapter 20, 30 and 31, the thesis of this great book, teaches us that. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may what? That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life through his name. That's the thesis. So John presents the deity of Jesus, no doubt about it. But as I said last night, there are little bits and pieces that you'll see through the Gospel of John where you see his humanity. And certainly this is one of them. He was emotionally strained. Do you know what it's like to be around somebody that's constantly after you? I can think of this in a very small illustrative way. We have three children. Twelve, nine, and seven. 
And those children, especially during the summer, always need something. They need a drink. They need to watch TV. They need something, Mom. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm tired. He hit me. And no, I didn't, by the way, hit them. I didn't, Mom. No, I didn't. No, no. We back and forth. You know how that goes. And I'll find my wife sometimes when I come home from work. I'll find her just sort of exhausted. And I'll say, what's the matter? She'll say, oh, I love them, but they've just been after me all day. <laughs> they want a drink. They want a this. They want that. And I understand what she means. They're just always after, always needing something. What's that do to you emotionally? It drains you, doesn't it? It makes you tired, even if it's with people you love. Well, this case in John chapter 11 and 12 was not with people that loved Jesus. These people were constantly trying to put him into the corner, constantly trying to trick him up, constantly trying to put him to death. And they wanted him to just slip up in the least little bit. And you know what? Most men, if you go after them long enough, they will slip up because they're men. But not Jesus. He was the God man. Yes, he was tempted at all points like as we are. Yet was without sin. Hebrews 4 and verse 15. Jesus is the one who can succor them that come to him. Why? Because he knew what it was like to deal with sin, yet never succumb to it. Hebrews 2 and verse 18. It is the case that Jesus in this scenario is mentally and emotionally drained. I can see it in the text. They've been after him. He's been tired. His heart was broken at the grave of Lazarus. His heart was broken over unbelieving people. He was tired. He was frustrated. And he just needed to pull back and spend some time, take a little vacation, if you will, with people whom he loved. And so he begins to pull back and he goes to Bethany. And it is in Bethany, this small village where his very close friends lived, that our narrative begins to unfold. Jesus goes to supper. And I want to pick up there and I'm going to share some points with you. Number one, we see from the text in John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the people of the supper. This is very important to understand the people of the supper. It's interesting whom Jesus is around. If you go to John chapter 12, let's pick up in verse 12, you're or verse 1 rather, you're already there. John chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, where Lazarus was which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. No surprise to us. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now this is kind of interesting, because Jesus and his friends come to this house. Remember I told you John's going to show us glimpses of his humanity? Don't read past this. You want to get to know the Lord? Get, him, get to know him in these settings. You know how much enjoyment we have when we're together? Like yesterday at that fellowship dinner where we where we ate and we joked and we laughed. And, and tonight we ate and we joked and we laughed and and we ate some more. <laughs> and don't we always eat? <laughs> we we laugh and we isn't that encouraging? Well that's one of the that's one of the greatest benefits of Christianity. I'm gonna tell you, it is the fact of being together. That's what Jesus is doing right now. He's he's with those he loves. He's at Simon the leper's house. And we learn that from Matthew 26 and verse 6, Mark 14 and verse 3. So we have all these people gathered here. Interestingly, Simon the leper. I want to know a little bit about more about him, but I know that apparently Jesus had touched his life in some way. Did he heal him? Yeah, I have a tendency to believe that. I believe that Jesus saved this man, and now Simon is hosting the party. It could be like a little get-together as a celebration of Lazarus' resurrection from the dead. That would be quite a celebratory thing, wouldn't it? That would be quite a time to gather around. Our friend has died. Jesus raised him from the dead. And now he is here before us. Many of the meals that Jesus attended were direct results of his interaction with someone. He changed people's lives and they were just like us. They got hungry, and they enjoyed fellowship, and they enjoyed time together. Zacchaeus in Luke 19, 5 and 6. You remember when Jesus said, Come down, I'm going to your house today. What did they do? They went to Zacchaeus' house, and they had a meal together, and they fellowshiped together. What about Matthew in Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 11? The, the man, the tax collector, the, the book that bears his name. What happened when Jesus called him from the receipt of custom, from the place where the taxes were collected? They went home 
at Matthew's house. And he sat, by the way, with sinners and ate supper there. Now, you don't want to read too much into that. We just really see that Jesus associated with those who needed the gospel. That's what he did. And that's what he was all about. This meal, however, seemed to have been a little bit different. It was a celebratory meal. It was the time that Lazarus had been raised, and it appears that Jesus is the guest of honor. You can understand that. He is sort of the hero of the day, and no doubt he truly is. This is most likely when Lazarus has been raised, and Martha and Mary are going to come, and they're going to fix something in the house. Simon the leper as a thank you dinner, if you will, for my Lord. Who's there? Well, we have Simon the homeowner, Simon the leper. This is his house. We're not given many details about this man except that he was a leper. Now, you understand about leprosy, I'm sure. You understand that this disease that would literally rot the skin away was a disease that was terrible during the time frame in which we find ourselves. And interestingly, I have a doctor friend who is a member of the Lord's Church in Ohio and one of our great supporters, one who helps me in, in preaching the gospel, he uh, actually came from India. And he said in India, it's still very much a prevalent disease. And uh, so we sort of think of Laz or leprosy as something old, you know. But he said, no, no, they still get it and they're still isolated. And there's really, from what I understand, uh, if I understand him right, no cure for it. Uh, they can have some relief, some things they can do, but there are certain forms that they still can't cure. Obviously, this affected a man in different ways, but all, often it would spread throughout the body and usually it would get white crust on their lips and their lips would begin to be eaten away. And, and it would be so much so that they would sort of cover the mouth as if not to breathe on anybody. And when anybody would come near, they would say, I'm clean, I'm clean. And you go back and read the Levitical laws in the book of Leviticus, you'll see a great picture of what uh, leprosy really is. And Mike probably has done this a hundred times, but I'll tell you, Mike, a great illustration. I preached this one time was the comparison of leprosy and sin. Oh, mercy. It's so, such a comparison. Some of these older preachers have preached sermons like that. I, I'm sure I got it from an older preacher. But, but leprosy is, is like a type of sin when you look at it. It eats and it continues to go on you. And if you get around people, it rub off on them. And oh, what, what comparisons. This man, at some point, was a leper, possibly healed by Jesus. Secondly, there's Lazarus, the resurrected. I wonder what that was like. I can't help but think in terms of humanity. Do you remember what was said of Lazarus in John chapter 11? He had been dead four days, and he stinketh. Stinketh, oh, King James. He stinketh. I can't help it. I have to do it. I, I, I'm there. Did he shower? What was that like? We sort of remove ourselves, don't we? We think here are all these superheroes to suffer. I want to know that. I don't know it from the text. I'm not being silly. I I'm being, I want to put myself at this supper. So what am I going to think? I'm going to think, Lazarus has been dead for four days. You know, after the third day, the body begins to decompose. What was that like? Did it change when Jesus raised him? The Bible's not definitive on it. It doesn't tell us. Uh, apparently not that big of a thing we need to know. But I still wonder about it. I wonder about Simon's leprosy. I wonder about that. Did he still have some of the scars and the marks from it? These were people. These were people. It helps me understand Jesus. Sometimes I'm around people that, that aren't like me. Simon the leper wasn't like Jesus. Lazarus the resurrected wasn't like Jesus. He might have smelled, but Jesus sat down to supper with him. Don't miss that point about your Lord. Number three, there was Martha the server. Here she is on her hands and knees preparing the supper. She's getting everything ready. Remember in Luke 10, verse 38 and following, Martha's the one that was cumbered about with much serving. She's that homemaker that you have in your mind. I can't help but think of my wife when I think of Martha. She's got her, she's got her apron on. And that's, that's where my wife spends a lot of her days in the kitchen. And, and she's got her apron on and she's cooking and she's baking and she's preparing things. And in doing so, she misses a lot, doesn't she? I find that interesting because mothers and homemakers miss a lot sometimes. How many sermons have moms missed because they've had to take their children out uh, to that little special place in the back where some of the children go to the cry room and if they aren't crying, they should be. But, but sometimes they take them out to those rooms, right? Mothers miss a lot. I think about the conversations we've had with people, people needing help and we'll sit down with them and all of a sudden one of the children will need something and mom has to get up and leave the living room. And, 
And she leaves us that conversation. So that you come back and say, pick me up. Where are we at? That was kind of Martha. She's always covered about with my serving. She's missing a lot. All right? Right, wrong, or indifferent. She's missing a lot. Martha's in the kitchen doing her part to be hospitable. Fourthly, there's Mary, the learner. And she is uh, at the feet of Jesus. She's listening to him like she was in Luke chapter 10. She is this person who wants to know everything she can about Jesus. It's almost like you hear Mary say, I'm a sponge. Fill me up, Jesus. I want to be like you. This is the sister of Martha and of Lazarus. And then we have Judas the fake. Now he's going to play an interesting part at this supper feast because Judas is there. I find it, I find it very interesting. Judas is in the inner circle of Jesus. Do you not find that sort of ironic? He's in the inner circle of Jesus. And Judas is one of those figures in the Bible that sort of scare me. And you say, why does he scare you? I say, because he had every opportunity to do the right thing. He did the very opposite. You know what I am? I'm a lot like Judas, and so are you. You have every opportunity to do the right thing, and how am I going to react to that? How are you going to react to that? I mean, Judas is the kind of person who's there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is the person who was uh, over in Jerusalem in the upper room when Matthew 26, 30 happened. They sung the hymn together. Judas is the one who ate the Passover meal with Jesus. Judas is the one that walked with Jesus, literally with the Master. He's the one that was so important in the group that he was the treasurer. We might look at a treasurer in the Lord's church as a pretty important figure, right? Has to be trustworthy, all these things. Absolutely. That was Judas. That was Judas. And he scares me. He's in the inner circle. Sixthly, there are the disciples present as well. We don't learn that from John's account. We learn that from Matthew and Mark. They inform us that the other disciples were present on this occasion as well. So it is during this supper that this situation of humility and this memorial that will never be forgotten happens. Let's move from the people of the supper, secondly, to the perfume of the saint. We pick that up in John chapter 12 and verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house is filled with the odor of the ointment. I profess to you, I've read over these quite often, and sometimes I have a tendency to sort of read past things. The Bible is like an un, uh, unpumpable well, Paul would say in Ephesians 3. What's that mean? It means the more you study it, the more you're impressed with it. It's like you can look over a passage of Scripture ten times. You can even preach on a passage of Scripture, and you come back to study it again, and you find something you missed the first time around or the tenth time around. That's kind of how John chapter 12 and verse 3 is. Let's break this down. Let's break this perfume down. Number one, let's look at the product. This was a pound, John says, of spikenard, which is very costly. Now, the pound, according to the Roman measure, was about 12 ounces according to our measure. Nard was kind of an interesting fragrance. It was extruded or extracted from the root and the spike. Hence the translation spike nerd of a plant native to northern India. Now you can imagine the cost that it would have taken them to bring this product to where they were. Let me give you a small illustration of that. I really have fallen in love with real maple syrup. I would recommend you don't do that unless you're willing to take out a small loan. <laughs> number one, to plant your own maple trees, or number two, to ship it. All right? Now, I live in Ohio where the Amish are, and the Amish, they just have uh, trees everywhere that they tap. And you say, well, can't you go to any Amish place and get, get maple syrup? What's the big deal? You can. I'm thankful they don't listen to the radio and stuff because they won't hear this. But uh, theirs is not near as good as the stuff I got in Vermont. My wife and I took a trip before we had children up through the New England states. And I went to Vermont and I went to what they call up there a sugaring shack. And in that sugaring shack, they showed you and explained the process to you. And they had four bottles of syrup. And you went down through them. One was dark and extra dark. And that was later on in the season. And you went with one that wasn't quite as dark, and that was midway in the season. And you went with the third one. But the first one was the one I was concerned about. They call it light fancy. And I thought syrup was syrup. Come on. 
And I mean to tell you what, they had a spoon there, and I about wore that bottle out. In fact, the lady said, are you going to buy some or are you going to leave one of the two? Not really, but she was thinking it. And so I bought me a gallon of that stuff. I mean, the only thing I bought on vacation was a gallon of light fancy syrup. Bad mistake. I brought it home and we began to eat it. And I began to eat it on everything. I mean, steak and potatoes and eggs and pancakes and all. Then I began putting in juice glasses and drinking it. It is phenomenal stuff. And I realized that we were almost out. So I went to order some more. And I couldn't find it anywhere but this little sugaring shack in Vermont. And so I said, send me a gallon. How bad could it be? I think it was $35 at the time. Send me a gallon. They did. But they shipped it in a gold box. It was like $30 to bring it here. I paid $75 total for a gallon of maple syrup. Oh, it was good. But I didn't drink it so fast now. We were a little bit slower on it. Oh, it's so good. Why is it so expensive? I had to import it. I had to import it. I had to bring it here. I had to pay for the shipping. I had to pay for the syrup. They All these things. So now, every year, when I get a little extra money, I say, Boy, I'd like to order some of that syrup. And my wife says it would just be cheaper to drive to Vermont and get it. <laughs> and so I'm back on Mrs. Butterworth, which isn't even syrup at all. I I'm really deprived, aren't I? I can only imagine what Mary must have spent for this. Because it was from northern India that this plant was extracted. This, this nard came from. And she would have shipped it in. Costly, costly stuff. And it was in a cruise, a type of cruise that was really designated to put one drop out at a time. That's the way it was. That's interesting to our narrative as we consider a little bit further. Not only do I want you to know the product, I want you to know the price. Due to the importation and the purity of this stuff, this was pure stuff. Some have estimated it's worth at about 300 pence or 300 denarii, Mark 14 and verse 5 tells us. Judas agreed, by the way, with that estimation in John chapter 12 and verse 5. Since a pence or a denarii was common for a day's wages, Matthew 10, uh, 20 and verse 2, the oil then was about worth one year's wages for a common labor. About, if you take off the holy days, the Sabbath days, and the other days they didn't work, about 300 days worth of wages. Can you imagine that? Now, that's the price of this stuff. That's the price of this stuff. That's important to put in your head. You see, when we get to know Jesus on an intimate basis, we're away with the superficial things of life. We've now come to the Master's feet, and we're going to do what it takes to please Him and to serve Him, right? I hear sometimes people saying, when I preach on repentance, They'll say, preacher, I'm caught up in this sin, and I would love to come to the Lord, but I'm in this sin. You don't understand. If you really understand what the Lord's all about, you'll leave that sin, and you'll come at the Master's feet, right? See, the problem with us, and myself included, is the fact that I really don't know Jesus when I make arguments like that. What am I going to do? You expect me to, to, to walk out of that situation? You expect me to, to not continue in that sin? had a man one time that loved alcohol. And he said, you just don't understand. I love to drink beer. He wanted to become a Christian. I said, become a child of God and I'll help you with it. Every time you get the urge to drink a beer, we'll sit down and drink a Mountain Dew together. I promise you drink 12 or 13 Mountain Dews, you aren't going to want any beer, right? You're going to be so sick. I said, we'll do it. I'll do it with you. No, I'm not ready. I like beer. I said, you just don't understand what you're comparing this to. You're comparing your eternal soul to something from the devil. You are looking at this completely wrong. Jesus, it's a great deal to leave these things. Yeah, but I'm worth it, aren't I? Mary thought so. She took this nard and was not worried about the price. I want you to look thirdly at the packaging. It was an alabaster box, Matthew 26 and verse 7 tells us, it was like a small vase, and it would have been maybe about that big, 12 ounces, kind of coming up to the top of the cruise, with the opening being very small, as for one little drop at a time. One little drop Mary may have taken from time to time and put it on herself. She might have used it to moisten her dry hands or her dry 
feet. Maybe that was the indicator. Maybe that's why she bought it in the first place. Maybe it was to anoint the body of someone very special after they had passed away. That could be the case. But Mary didn't use that little neck. She didn't use that little vase to put one drop on it. Nextly, I want you to notice the parts. The Bible says she anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Now, Matthew and Mark both recount that Mary anointed the head of Jesus as well. Matthew 26 and verse 7, Mark 14 and verse 3. Now, ladies, I'm going to need you for this illustration. It would be ridiculous for me to try to wipe somebody's feet with my hair. <laughs> so I need your help. Can you imagine putting something on someone's feet and then taking your hair and wiping their feet with your hair? Could there be a more smelly, dirty part of the body? The feet! Well, you preacher, they... They washed feet and stuff like that back then. Yeah, so did I before I come to worship. Would you like to wipe your hair on my feet? I'll be honest with you. I don't like to remove somebody's socks. Do you? I mean, let's not read through this. Let's understand what we're dealing with. Mary got down to Jesus and wiped her hair on his feet. Shined his feet. Rubbed. And you can imagine how she caressed and how soft she would have. How lovingly she would have done this. This is beyond my comprehension. You see the love Mary had for the Lord. No expense spared. No, nothing greater than Mary. This is one of the greatest acts of service you'll ever see in the Bible. And Mary is the one who performs it. Now, given the background of this narrative, knowing a little bit about Palestine, there is the case in Palestine that no respectable woman would ever appear in public with her hair down. That is a big part of the story we don't want to miss. They would bring their hair up and often cover their heads. I don't want you to think very carefully about Muslims today. Much like that hair covering is some Muslims that you would say. Now, I'm not suggesting Mary was a Muslim. Please, understand that. I'm simply saying it would have been the same type of culture. In fact, one scholar has said, and I find this very interesting, on the day a girl was married, and I quote, her hair was bound up, and never again would she be seen in public with her tresses or her locks flowing loose. In fact, he goes on to say, it is the sign of an immoral woman to appear in public with her hair unbound. But not Mary. She doesn't care what everybody else says. She is sacrificially worshiping her Lord. And that's all she's concerned about. The people of the supper the perfume of the saint. Thirdly, I want you to know the protest of the selfish. Go to John chapter 12 again. I want you to look at verses 4 through 6. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, we should betray him. Now listen to this. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? I love verse 6. The commentary in the Bible is amazing. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Do you know how often sometimes that people will use religious situations to try to exploit things like Judas did? What was he saying? Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think we should use our money for that because I'll tell you, we could do something greater with our money. Right? That's what he's saying. But it's not genuine. It's not like, I have an idea. Listen, I have an idea we could use that for this. It's the idea of, you put it in the bag. Why was he so concerned about the bag? He was a thief. This was lining his pocket. He didn't want it to go somewhere else because he was a thief. The Bible's very clear about that, isn't it? I find it very interesting that this man who bore the bag was a thief. 
He took it right out of the bag and put it in his pocket. He wasn't afraid to. He had no remorse about it. And he even went so far as to say, we could have done something better with this. I could have bought some new shoes or sandals, or I could have bought something new with this instead of giving it to Jesus. I would be remiss if I didn't make application here. How many times in a men's business meeting have you ever heard somebody bring up something that we want to do and someone else will say, well, we don't really want to spend our money on that. I, I sometimes wonder why don't we want to spend our money on that? 